What's up, my homies and my chooms? Good to be back with y'all. So we've talked about hair loss on my channel a lot, and naturally that means we've also discussed finasteride, and that is for good reason. Finasteride is, after all, the best treatment on the market for treating androgenic alopecia and crushing the slaphead curse. It is the only treatment on the market that has not only been clinically proven to be effective in the short term, but also in the long term, as it has been proven effective even after 10 years of continued use, and it is not uncommon to find people who have been on the drug for over 20 years and still maintain all of the wonderful benefits the drug has caused them. My friends, we are extremely blessed to be living in an era where solving hair loss is as simple as just taking a pill and forgetting about it. And for the few people where taking finasteride is not enough, there is also minoxidil. And that is why, despite all the research into alternative pharmaceutical treatments, the finasteride and minoxidil stack is still the gold standard for treating hair loss. Now, as we all know, the internet has been revolutionary in providing a plethora of information to the public about literally any subject. But it has sadly, through social media, also given a platform to those who wish to cause harm to others for their own selfish reasons. Hair loss is a mentally and cosmetically debilitating condition, and many who have lost the good fight against hair loss have taken it upon themselves to see as many other people fail as they possibly can simply due to the fact that misery loves company and it's easier to be a loser when you're surrounded by other losers because, you know, that helps you cope. These people cannot tolerate the fact that the overwhelming majority of men who use finasteride have had great success with the drug because every time someone uses finasteride and reports success with it, it makes their own decision to not use finasteride come across as foolish. The last thing a bald coper wants to hear is for someone to ask them, why didn't you just use finasteride when you still had the chance? They hate that question because deep down, they know it is true. It really resonates with them painfully, knowing that the side effects are rare, that the horror stories people spread online are not substantiated by any evidence-based research, and they know and they hate the fact that the majority of people who take finasteride will experience no adverse side effects, and the few that do experience adverse side effects can easily mitigate them through titration adjustments. So the next time you hear someone tell you to just shave it, bro, remember, they're not saying that for your sake, they're saying it for their own sake. So in their desperation to see other people fail like they have, they've turned to a new tactic. They are now claiming that finasteride will cause irreversible infertility as well as birth defects. Now, it is medically known that women who are pregnant or trying to conceive should not use or handle finasteride since in that case, it indeed can cause birth defects. But not being satisfied with just that, finasteride haters are now claiming finasteride will cause birth defects even if just men take it. Now, you'd think with such outlandish claims, they'd have some massive piece of conclusive research like, you know, a randomized control trial with hundreds or thousands of subjects, but no. All they have here is a case report that was published in 2011. This particular case report involves a 48-year-old man who had been trying to conceive with his 37-year-old wife and had no success after four years of trying. He'd been on finasteride uh, at one milligram per day for many years. They don't specify, but we can assume it's been a long time. So important to note here is that the man had no side effects from finasteride, including no erectile dysfunction. They did a semen analysis, a semen analysis and it showed he had normal semen volume, normal sperm concentration, as well as normal sperm motility. They did check what's called the sperm DNA fragmentation index, also known as DFI, and this was 30%, which was high. So what does this DFI thing actually mean? Well, DFI is a measurement of DNA damage in the sperm, and it can be a cause of infertility. A DFI of 30% is considered abnormal, and because of this, the doctors advised that he stop finasteride in order to see if it would stop the infertility problem. Three months after stopping finasteride, the DFI went down to 21%, and three months later, it went down to 16.5%, which is considered normal. It's worth mentioning that even after the DFI dropped down, his wife still didn't get pregnant, which raises the possibility that it was more of a problem with her rather than with him. However, the doctors who wrote the case report felt that the abnormal DFI the subject had before stopping finasteride was actually due directly to the finasteride. So, this does seem pretty concrete at first, but one major problem 
problem with it is that we don't have any measurement of the DF5 before he started finasteride. Because keep in mind, he had already been on finasteride for many years, as they stated, but the worst case scenario is that even if he did have an altered DF5 for finasteride, it's clear that the DF5 rapidly returned to normal within three months after stopping treatment. So based on this one case report, it does seem that this 48-year-old gentleman may have had fertility problems related to finasteride, but it is noteworthy that this case report was published way back in 2011, and since then, we've had no subsequent data to back up the reliability of this research. You know, for all we know, this could have just been an outlier, and the DFI could have been due to some other cause that we can't identify at all. I mean, who knows? Maybe he worked with x-rays, or he was drinking a lot of booze to cope with not being able to knock up his wife. I mean, there's many, many uh, factors that could have caused it that we don't know about. So, this is just another example of why a case study isn't usually considered strong research. Also, we know for a fact that finasteride certainly isn't birth control. I mean, there have been many healthy babies conceived by men who are on finasteride. So, even though there hasn't been another study or case report on DFI on finasteride, there is more data on the effect of finasteride on male fertility in general, fortunately. So, uh, in fact, this very case report actually references a study done in 2007 that involved 99 men who were randomized to a dutasteride 0.5 milligram group or a finasteride 5 milligram group versus a placebo control group. So, this is a much more uh, thorough study than the case report, which just looked at one bloke for whom all we know was exposing his balls to radiation on a daily basis. Here we have an actual randomized double-blind and controlled study with a fairly large sample size of patients, 99 in fact. So during this study, semen samples were taken and various measures were made including sperm count, seminal volume, sperm morphology, as well as sperm motility. So basically they were just trying to assess fertility in general. Also they measured serum testosterone and DHT levels in all subjects. As far as how they extracted the sperm from the patients, it's probably better not to ask that. So we know the methodology here is good because they're measuring fertility across several several parameters, but what were the results of the actual study? Well, as expected, dutasteride and finasteride lowered serum DHT levels. With dutasteride, serum DHT levels were lowered by 93% at 26 weeks, and with finasteride, the DHT was lowered by 70%. Although, keep in mind, we're talking about serum DH here, DHT here. We're not talking about scalp DHT. Now, as far as serum testosterone goes, uh, they rose by about 25% in the dutasteride and finasteride groups after 8 weeks of treatment, but after that they returned close to baseline, but they were still slightly elevated. And this is expected because you're preserving the good hormone testosterone by preventing the 5-AR enzyme from turning it into the trash hormone dihydrotestosterone, DHT, and effectively wasting it. This slight increase in testosterone won't have any ergogenic benefit from a sports performance standpoint, but it might be why some people report things like slightly elevated libido while they're on 5-AR inhibitors. So, Looking at the semen parameters of this study's outcome, after 24 weeks, the total sperm count was reduced by about 34% 34% in the finasteride group and 29% in the dutasteride group. So that sounds bad, right? Well, stay with me here because after 52 weeks, the sperm count had risen yet again to the point where the difference between baseline levels was no longer statistically significant. And additionally, there was further improvement in sperm count after stopping the drug for 20 to 24 weeks. Another measured parameter was semen volume, which was reduced in both the dutasteride and the finasteride group after 26 weeks and remained reduced in the dutasteride group after 52 weeks. Although so if you look at these graphs here, uh, the difference really doesn't seem to be that uh, clinically significant. It looks pretty mild to me. I mean, it's not like any of these drugs could be considered effective birth control or anything of the sort. But um, anyways, that's just semen uh, volume we're looking at here. So let's look at actual sperm concentration. The sperm average uh, concentration remained relatively constant in all the treatment groups throughout the study, except in the finasteride group at 26 weeks, where it decreased significantly at 22%. However, the good news about that is that by 52 weeks, the sperm concentrations of the finasteride group had gone back to normal, and this result really correlates with the rest of finasteride's supposed side effects, because it has been shown that even when people do get side effects from finasteride, they usually will get better over time with continued use, and that applies to fertility as well, it seems. So, for the last observed parameters, the researchers looked at sperm motility, which showed a small decrease in both the dutasteride and finasteride groups of about 10%. Sperm morphology was not changed with either the finasteride or dutasteride group, though. 
So being that fertility is a multifactorial equation that is contingent on several parameters, how do we put this all into perspective? Well, the authors of the study concluded that the two drugs had a mild negative impact in sperm formation in men. The average effect on the parameters affecting fertility did not actually fall below the thresholds for clinical significance in the drugs, except for one point in time when the total sperm count of finasteride was low at 26 weeks. But if you remember, that resolved by itself by 52 weeks. So the bottom line is that none of these changes from finasteride Asteride or dutasteride are enough to cause fertility issues in the vast majority of people. They did point out that approximately 5% of the subjects on treatment had more severe decreases in sperm count, so it may be that there are some individuals that are more sensitive to these drugs than others, but even if you are one of those 5%, we know that stopping the drug causes a relatively quick reversal of the problem, six months at the very most. Also, keep in mind that this is based on five milligrams of finasteride. The authors note that in a previous study, there was no effect found on finasteride uh, of finasteride on sperm production whatsoever. However, the dose in that study was one milligram daily, which of course is the standard dose for treating androgenic alopecia. So it is likely that the result of the current study would be even more optimistic if the dosage were equivalent to what is used to treat androgenic alopecia instead of enlarged prostate. The authors also note that the recovery after stopping treatment was quicker in the finasteride group, which may be due to the shorter half-life of finasteride compared to dutasteride. So since both drugs have a pretty marked effect on serum DHT levels, the authors felt that this suggests that, quote, testosterone alone may be sufficient to maintain qualitatively normal spermatogenesis in most normal men, unquote. So this is yet another reason in the very long list of reasons as to why DHT is a trash hormone. You don't need it post-puberty. Testosterone is what makes you a man. DHT just makes you an ugly old bald man. And if you're bald, you're probably not going to find a woman who will let you put a baby in her to begin with. So pretty much the only outlet you'll have for being a father as a bald man is donating your semen to clinical research like in the trial we just reviewed. So what can we conclude from all this? Can finance have a small effect on fertility in a small percentage of men who use it? Yes, but in the majority of men, it doesn't make any difference. And even if fertility is affected, it usually goes back to normal with continued use. And even in the worst case scenario, scenario where fertility stays low while on treatment, you can either reduce your dosage and failing that, you can just temporarily drop the treatment and just give it the good old college try with your old lady for a maximum of three to six months. And anything you lose in terms of hair during that time, you'll likely be able to get back once you get on treatment again. So I wouldn't sweat it. And also you can temporarily switch to topical antiandrogens like fluoridyl or alpha dial to kind of tide you over while you're doing the nasty with your lady. So that pretty much covers everything regarding fertility. But one final question that people often ask me that I want to address is whether there is enough finasteride in the semen to cause birth defects in women when they get pregnant. Well, the answer to this is no, but in case you want more details, the UK drug database site on finasteride states, quote, a small amount of finasteride, less than 0.001% of the one milligram dose per ejaculation has been detected in the seminal fluid of men taking Propecia. Studies in rhesus monkeys have indicated that this amount is unlikely to constitute a risk to the developing male fetus, unquote. In addition, no credible reports of birth effects have, be, have ever been found related to finasteride in semen. So unsurprisingly, this is just yet another manufactured controversy intended to frighten people out of using finasteride. But hopefully after this video, you'll cast your fears aside and know that saving your hair doesn't mean you have to abandon your progeny. After all, the world will need a new generation of people to fight against the slaphead propaganda in the future. And with that, I'm out, homies. See you next time.